welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone, show number 77 for the 9th of April 2010. Richard Saunders here from Sydney, Australia. What a mixed bag we have for you this week on the show. We're going to kick off with a speech given by our executive officer in the Australian Skeptics and the editor of the Skeptic magazine, The Skeptic, Tim Mendham. Now, this was recorded at the uh, last Sydney Skeptics in the pub with Dr. Aichi followed by Aran Segev and then Tim Mendham. A little bit of news and information along with that. After that, Rachie comes back with Dr. Rachie Reports, looking at the latest goings-on with that wacky, crazy, zany bunch at the Australian Vaccination Network and the equally wacky and zany bunch at Homeopathy Plus. After that, it's Iran Segev back again with a grain of salt. He's going to be talking to country nurse Wendy Whelan about an amazing success rate in vaccination. And then to wrap the show up, Kylie Sturgis will interview Crispian Jago. Now, he's the guy. He's the guy from the UK who did those fantastic uh, Simpsons cards of famous skeptics. Well worth a listen. So sit back, grab that ginger beer, and enjoy The Skeptic Zone. a couple of minutes of sort of news and events that have been happening in the last month and then I'll introduce our speaker and Tim will speak for about 20 minutes. Tim? Yeah? Three minutes. Great. <laughs> and then what, 17 minutes of questions, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Aran's told me I have to put this on my... Is that better? No, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can anyone hear me now? Can you guys sitting up the back in the big, like, chairs hear me? Okay. All right, so um, those of you who don't know, uh, we have a segment on 2GB on uh, Saturday nights. It's usually myself and Richard Saunders who's not here tonight, but last week it was with Dr Chrissy Wilson, who I introduced earlier. Um, 2GB is the high, recently the ratings came out and they're the highest rating AM station or in fact the highest rating station in Sydney uh, we do a segment usually around 10.30 on Saturday night so I'm not quite sure how many people are listening at that time of night but um, if you want to hear the podcast of that it's up on the website australianskeptics.com.au or skeptics.com.au uh, and also, I just wanted to update you on uh, TAM Australia. For those of you who don't know, we're hosting TAM Australia this year, November 26 to 28, at the Sydney Masonic Centre, which is there, like literally a block away. Um, we will have the launch of the website very, very soon. Uh, we've announced the first round of speakers. They are the likes of James Randi, the entire uh, cast from The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, uh, Dr Eugenie Scott from CFI, Simon Singh is coming. Um, who else, Iran is coming? DJ Grothy, um, George Rab. So, uh, Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. This is just the first round of speakers w that we've announced. There will be lots and lots more. Um, when we launch the website, there'll also be information about how you can apply to be a part of TAM. So we're going to make this a part uh, for the whole community to get involved. It's not just going to be the big guns, but these guys have been announced now because we have to arrange ahead of time to get them here from England or from um, America. But there's going to be lots and lots of lots more speakers, panels, workshops, all kinds of stuff. So we'll keep you informed as to when we launch the website. When that happens, you can then um, apply to become involved. And we're also looking for volunteers and stuff, so keep your eye out on skeptics.com.au or Twitter. If you don't follow me on Twitter, I'm Dr. Rachie. I'll keep you updated. Or you can follow Australian Skeptics. Uh, April the 1st, Sorry, April the 10th to the 16th is World Homeopathy Awareness Week. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, so if we don't pay attention to it, it works better. <laughs> people aware that um, homeopathy there's nothing in it or otherwise 
known as bollocks. Um, I'm already starting to organise some uh, coverage. I've written a couple of blog posts which are going to be published on the 16th. Um, I'm getting some journos interested in doing some stuff. On the 10th, you mean? Sorry, on the 10th of April. Um, if you're on Twitter, the hashtag is going to be WHAW, World Homeopathy Awareness Week, but we're also going to have a, a campaign running at the same time to demonstrate to people that it's just water. So if you want to keep involved, find me on Twitter, find me on Facebook, or check our website, skeptics.com.au. And before I hand over to Tim... Um, you can work with it. Piece of news. Okay, but I haven't finished yet. <laughs> uh, at the moment, I don't know what time it is in London, James, is it almost 9.30? No, it's quarter past eight. Quarter past eight in the morning. Okay. Uh, it's early in the morning on Thursday in London at 9.30am, London time this morning, Simon Singh will be appearing in court to receive the, um, fi the findings for whether he um, is allowed to appeal the decision where the BCA, the British Chiropractic Association, sued him for defamation for calling some of their practices bogus. Uh, that's going to be handed down today. Um, there are big implications for the futures of libel laws in the UK. The UK is known as a place to, to what is called libel tourism, whereby people come from all over the world to sue people there because it's a very expensive process and it takes a long time. And essentially, if you get sued for libel in the UK, you either hold your hands up and say okay, I'm sorry, or it's going to cost you a lot of money. It's already cost Simon Singh £100,000. He thinks it's going to cost him a million bucks, but he's going to fight it. So if you haven't signed the petition to um, change libel in the UK, please head to senseaboutscience.org, or you can just search for it on Google. And we hope that in about an hour and well, two hours we'll know the decision for whether he's allowed to appeal. So I'm going to hand over to Aran Segev, the President of Australian Skeptics. Thanks very much. Just a quick piece of very important news. The AVN has recently um, managed to uh, collect enough money or enough pledges of money to continue operations. Um, and Meryl Dory announced that she uh, will resign as president. We're not sure exactly what was supposed to be um, uh, advertised, but they decided to advertise in the Sydney's Child magazine and the equivalents in um, Canberra, no, Melbourne and Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. It's uh, Sydney's Child, Melbourne Child and Brisbane Child are all magazines that are uh, distrib distributed freely in um, places like baby shops and um, daycare centers and young parents read them a lot. So for the AVN to advertise in those magazines uh, could be quite bad. So the AVN now have a bit of money. They wanted to advertise and we are happy to tell you that today they were knocked back. We were, we were going to do something about it, but the uh, publisher um, decided basically of their own accord that they don't want to deal with the AVN, and good on them for doing that. Yeah. And now we'll hand over to Tim. Can people hear me? Yes, thank you. That's a shame. Okay. <laughs> My name is Tim Mendham. I'm the Executive Officer of uh, Australian Skeptics. And probably with about one other person in this room, um, I've been involved with the Skeptics since its very start. The other person is Ian Bryce down there, actually. Right. Now, that was actually 30 years ago, and I know you're saying, oh, you look so young. <laughs> I can happily say that I actually joined the Skeptics when I was five years old. Right. I wish. In 1980... Uh, which is a fair while ago. James Randi came to Australia at the uh, bequest of, at the, at the request, sorry, at the request of Dick Smith, and they were performing some tests on water diviners, dowsers, that sort of thing. And Dick Smith at the time said, "Well, you know, we'd like to get people together who who have this sort of similar approach to pseudoscience and the paranormal, who are equally sceptical, and it'd be nice to form an association, wouldn't it?" Um, in Melbourne, a lawyer named Mark Plummer instantly put his hand up and said, we'll start this organisation and we'll call it Australian Skeptics. And uh, that, uh, so Dick Smith became a patron of it, as did Philip Adams uh, at the time. And the Sydney branch started up pretty soon after. Barry Williams, who was seeing this same sort of uh, information about Dick Smith, put his hand up and said, if you ever sort of want to start something up here, I'll be in. 
anyone who volunteers knows what's that like. You get become suddenly the, the, the main person in it. Barry, who I know, knew at that time because I'm a journalist editor and he was a, <laughs> an exhibitionist, <laughs> um, asked me if I was interested in joining and I said yes. So we had a very first committee meeting in the US Department of Commerce and we, ate, we drank their beer quite a lot, which was very nice actually for them to pay for it. So that was in 1980, 1981. The Melbourne Committee was the, the main bunch. They were the, they were the, the powerhouse of the sceptics at the time. And uh, anyone who knew Mark Plummer at the time reckoned that he was the closest thing to a perpetual motion machine you've ever seen. Mark Plummer had the wonderful habit of phoning up about 2 o'clock in the morning all the time and saying, I've got an idea. And he, especially after a while, he went to America and he still did it, actually. And you had to try and explain to him there's a time difference between New York and Australia. Never mind. He never knew. They worked on a magazine. Now, this is a little bit of potted history of where the sceptics sort of promoted themselves, and I'll make some comments later on about how this has developed and how, what changes there have been. The very first issue was a tabloid, appropriately. Now, this is rare, so you can't touch it, right? <laughs> this is, honestly, there are not many copies of this around. It's called uh, The Skeptic, and if anyone who knew at the time a magazine called The Skeptical Inquirer, which was the American equivalent, um, they have exactly the same typeface on the sceptic. So someone with a pair of scissors just sort of cut that out and stuck it down, and that's why the sceptic looked like that, actually. I'm not going to comment on the spelling of sceptic. I don't think that was quite the same, but certainly the look of it. And this was a massive four pages, right? Not a lot in there, but what was in there is interesting to look back at it as to what was the, the main concerns at the time, right? What was really sort of bugging us at the time? And in here is sceptics test psychic surgeons. So I don't know if anyone remembers psychic surgeons. People used to put their hands in your guts and pull out chicken blivers, right? right? And say, look, I've, I've cured you of cancer, etc. A lot of happened, used to happen a lot in the Philippines. Doris Stokes wrong, says the police. That was a big story. And Perth was going to be inundated with a, a tidal wave, according to a psychic. And the sceptics very happily pointed out that it wasn't. <laughs> Perth is still there and it hasn't been gone. Okay, this is in a plastic bag, you notice. As I say, very rare. They decided not to do the four-page tabloid after a while. And the next issue was a more modest sort of uh, A4. It was about uh, 16 pages, I think. Hand-typed, stuck down on a, on, a, on a bit of artboard and then printed up. Largely, it looks like it's photocopied. Right? A lot of the information came from the Americans and uh, that's the way it worked. Lo and behold, Mark Plummer got the job of working with the Americans, what was then called PSYCOP, it's now called CSI. Um, he was brought over there as their executive director for a while because like, no one had the energy of Mark Plummer, right? And so they wanted him there, they wanted an Australian there. So he was one of the first of the Australian sort of invasions of America. No one in Melbourne really wanted to take over the role, so it passed the National Committee at that time, passed to Sydney. Uh, that was Barry and myself and a bunch of others. And uh, me, because I was not looking at the time, I became secretary, treasurer and editor of the magazine at the time. And I did that for about five years. Okay, and it's a lot of work. But we actually went out and bought a computer. And this was, this was a breakthrough. This was a technology breakthrough for the sceptics. We bought a Mac Plus. And instead of being hand-typed and stuck down a bits of paper, we were, uh, put it on a, a Mac Plus and it broke down every five minutes, right? We, we, we pushed the boundaries of technology. And anyone knows a Mac, you had this little bomb that used to come up, right? Just as you were about to save the information, right? 16 pages and wham, it would go down. So you've got to do the whole lot all over again. It made it very popular with us, actually. Especially the way you couldn't do a headline across the whole top of a page. You had to do it in two halves and try and make it fit. Never did. Big space between the two. OK, next major breakthrough. And I'll explain all the significance of this later on. Colour. <laughs> As in a bit of coloured paper, right? <laughs> and picture, right? This picture, for those who can see it, was actually me cobbling together headlines from newspapers, right? And then trying to photocopy it. There's a lot of photocopying done in those days. Just to go back to the first issues here, the second issue we had here, the one that came out of Melbourne, the second issue, the main headline here is about levitating meditators. Uh, this was, this was a, a short-lived trend amongst the transcendental meditation people. They stood around. You know, the Maharishi sort of bunch. You know, transcendental meditation people reckoned their followers could fly, which is pretty cool, right? And they reckon they had these photos of their people in, the, in a, in a uh, lotus position flying. So we said, fine. Everyone was waiting for the big unveiling of this thing. And finally we saw these uh, meditators, TM people, sitting on, the, on, the, on a cushion, and they flew. 
by flexing their legs and trying to bounce up from a lotus position. They must have got that high, actually, right? And it ruined their hips, I'm sure, and their legs. But that was they, that's what they claim was flying. That was a big story in 1980. When I went to this issue, the first desktop, the big story was uh, Peter Brock's energy polarizer, right? A technology thing to make a car run better by attaching what was supposedly a battery to the engine, right? Uh, it didn't work, and it actually helped to make Peter Brock lose his hold and sponsorship. This wonderful first colour issue, very impressive, uh, was also in about 1988. <coughs> the big story here was uh, police use of psychics. The Nullarbor UFO, I don't even anyone remembers that, a family was sort of kidnapped across the Nullarbor, a woman and her three rather grotesque sons, and they reckon they were hit by a UFO on top of them. There was all sorts of UFO dust everywhere. And the other story is Carlos Hoax. Anything you remember with Carlos? You remember the car? Uh, James Randi was out here visiting, and there was a visiting psychic named Carlos, uh, who was a bit of a semi mystic Mexican mixture of all sorts of things. Big show at the Opera House, um, 60 Minutes did a program on him. Turned out to be a total hoax that James Randi had set up. Carlos is a friend of his, pretended to be a psychic. Well, he was basically trying to point out that the media were a bunch of gullible fools. And the media instantly fell for it and said, No one asked him, Are you a hoax? They instantly. George Negus came close. Okay, who did? George, George Negus was the only one who did come close. He actually also interviewed a fellow from the Skeptics named Harry Edwards, who pointed out how to do his stopping the pulse and that sort of stuff, right? But most of the Skeptics didn't know it was a hoax. It was a, it was a world kept secret. I didn't know it was a hoax. Only a few people did. It was revealed to me about 15 minutes before the show, 60 Minutes, went to air, their second show. And that basically saying the media never asked if it was a hoax. They took his bullshit hook, line, and sinker. And, and then when they finally revealed their work, I was pretty upset and said, how dare you fool the media? And you're just basically showing how easy it is. So Randy was out here initially to comment how terrible this Carlos was and then to actually reveal he's one of us. OK. Now, these publications are a long way from this, which is where we are today. Uh, in our 30th year now, this is the... Second oldest skeptic magazine, third oldest skeptic magazine, second oldest skeptic magazine in the world. Right? 30 years is pretty damn good. We are the third oldest skeptical organisation in the world, after Psychop and the Brits, I think. There are skeptic organisations everywhere. But, you know, we have come a long way, we are still in existence. We have a magazine like this, subscriptions available in hard copy or PDF, just come and see me afterwards. <laughs> um, two other things I'd like to point out. We put out a couple of books during the 80s. Our first book was on creationism. I don't know who designed the cover, but it was someone with a bad case of <laughs> vertigo, I think. It was creationism in Australian perspective. It was a lot of looking at the arguments of creationists and our responses to them. Written by some of you might know Martin Bridgestock and Ken Smith. And it was that book that actually um, allowed them to be the first life members of Australian skeptics. That's what we, we thanked them for for doing that book. They became life members, the first ones. Canberra Skeptics, who are of course still going as well, collated a number of articles which they put out in a book called Skeptical. Sorry, it's sold out. It's sold out about 20 years ago. And there hasn't been a reprint. Covered a whole lot of little articles, like a page and a half, similar to the sort of stuff you get on the website now, looking at different topics. The interesting thing is the range of topics that are here. And the range of topics that were of interest to the skeptics then, and the range of topics that are of interest to the skeptics now. There's two alternative medicine stories in there. Um, don't forget, this came out about 20-odd years ago. One of the stories is on chiropractic, and the other one is on aromatherapy. Right? Now, in most of those magazines, you go back and look at them, and the number of alt-med stuff is very little. You get psychic surgery, you get a lot of faith healing, if you can call that um, alternative medicine. You get a few fringe things. We, there are not the coverage, and there was not the media coverage of what we now regard as alt med. That has developed, and me, after my stint as editor, treasurer, and secretary, and I've actually died doing it, I can proudly say, I actually had to go out and earn a living as well, which tended to take me away a bit from the full time scepticism, but I was always interested, always involved, but a bit on the fringes. Last year I came back on board in a full time capacity as executive officer, thank you guys. Really loving it, right? It's absolutely fantastic. But the most important thing is what I've seen change. Now, this is like 30 years. Ian's probably got the same thing. It's amazing changes. When we first started, scepticism was our dirty little secret. 
in the same way as atheism was a dirty little secret. You didn't want to raise it at dinner parties. You've you, you heard the Tim Minchin you know, song about that. It was worse than that, right? You didn't want to raise it at all because you were just scorned upon. How dare you be a spoiled sport? And you sort of hung around saying, I'm a skeptic. I'm a skeptic, right? And you just didn't want to say it. Suddenly, in that intervening period, in the same way as atheism has come out of the closet, scepticism has also come out of the closet. And suddenly you could say, we have meetings like this. In the old days, we used to do media interviews. I used to do them a lot. And you'd regularly hear the first thing they'd say to you, the, the, the radio presenter, we're going to have a bit of fun with it. Right? You think, oh, shit. <laughs> I don't want to be fun. This is serious, right? But what used to happen, you'd be at the end of a radio program like they have the lost dog story at the end of the news. Right? And you feel terrible. They'd always ask you, almost guaranteed, but do the sceptics believe in themselves? And you say, congratulations, you're the one millionth person to ask that question, right? Um, you try to encourage the media, but the media were a pain in the backside. It has changed. Some media still regard you as, as a, bit of a bit of a joke, as a bit of the, the funny side of things. They still ask you occasionally, do the sceptics believe in themselves? But at the same time, they stop and ask you serious questions. I did an interview just the other day with 2GB, but for a pre-recorded for a program going out at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and the two things I wanted to talk about were UFOs, which cropped up a lot 30 years ago, and vaccination, which didn't crop up a lot 30 years ago. And that's one of the big differences, that, that the, the topics that are covered now are very different, and some of them are a lot more serious than they used to be in the old days. To a certain extent that the sceptics used to be investigating the paranormal and pseudoscience, probably as much now it's pseudoscience and paranormal is the emphasis. Um, what I have seen change is not just the topics and not just the fact that sceptics are out and quite happily, in most cases, uh, fearless in saying they are sceptics, but in the fact that the community has changed. When we first did the magazine, it was that little committee, it was a small bunch of uh, supporters, subscribers, and it was the magazine. And that was it. That was the entire media outlet for the sceptics. We used to push ourselves to the, to the uh, popular media, but as far as the outputting of the view, it was that little magazine, 16 pages of hand-typed information. When I come back in now, it's totally changed. The magazine is just one aspect of how the message is being put out. It's a good aspect. Subscriptions available, hard copy, PDF, see me afterwards. But there are other things. There's the bloggers, the Facebook people, the, the, the Twitterers, and you name it. And suddenly there are people beyond that basic magazine subscription level in all areas. We obviously didn't have podcasts. We obviously didn't have sort of online services of any sort in the old days. Uh, we didn't even have computers to do it. Um, but the approach now is fresh and it's vital and it's here. And it's what you see here. There's a lot of younger people, not many beards. I'm a token beard person, but I'm only five years old. Um, it's, it's just, it's fresh and it's, and what I've come is I'm stunned. It's, it's where it's moving, it's, it's active. It's enthusiastic. It's taking every advantage of every bit of technology you can to spread the message, and it's doing it very, very well. Compared to the old days, which was tentative and hesitant and a little bit embarrassed, and now it's quite the opposite. So I congratulate everybody here. I congratulate the Skeptics Movement. I congratulate all the podcasters and Facebookers and Twitterers and meetups and everybody like that, because it is a new world in the scepticism these days, and it's very exciting. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Dave. Tim, um, <clears throat> thanks a lot. That was fascinating. Um, how have things changed with the advent of the internet and the online skeptical networking? Well, yeah, when, when I first started, there was no such thing. Oh, no. It didn't exist, right? I mean, what I'm saying now is, is that the, the message is spreading spread so much more quickly. Before, it was a quarterly magazine, and that was it. And now the message can get out there within seconds. There's better organisation. There's better sort of um, spread of information. One of the things that I've been doing is a lot of stuff on the AVN. And once upon a time, I would have had to go solo to do research. Now I just get in touch with Ken McLeod, Daniel Raphael, the whole bunch like that, and I get information like that. So if we're talking about a media response, for instance, we're trying to get a story in, we can get information straight out. Right? Once upon a time you had to write a letter to get a press release out. Now we don't have to. I mean, is that what you're talking about? The, the, the internet? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the podcasting which is the most interesting thing. It's just unheard of from, you know, from way back when. It's just a, it's fresh and it's enthusiastic, it's humorous and it's everything. So it's really good. 
Obviously, the, uh, the enemies of reason are using the internet as well. Do you think we're winning? Yeah. <laughs> Frankly, we're never going to win. We will have little victories everywhere, like with the AVN. We've had a lot of victories with the AVN. I think Meryl Dory's going off a nut. Right. With this, no, she's saying some very strange things now. She's always said some strange things, but she's saying things that are so easily picked up and, and disproved now. Um, she's lost um, her sense of perspective. I think the fact that these ads were knocked back from Sydney's child is going to give her the shit so much. It's fabulous. <laughs> because she knows. She's, she's always been claiming paranoia. Now she's, she's right. <laughs> But, I mean, yeah, but, but that, that's what I mean. I mean, there, there, were, there were always things. If you notice here, the different interests that come and go. I mean, UFOs have come and go in cycles, right? UFOs are silly sort of fun things, and they're not really that harmful, except unless you become a... Were the, were the Aurelians? Or who are the ones who... The, are the cult people in San Francisco who kill themselves? The Rayleigh. Yeah. yeah. Them, right? That's when it starts getting worrying. But then you get the Jim Jones who did the same thing. With, Jim Jones used to raise people from the dead and bend spoons. He took 900 people to their death, Right? I mean, you know, spoon bending is fun unless you actually kill people. So if these things go up and down, UFOs are back in the news recently, but they'll go down again. Psychic surgeons haven't heard from them for a while. Crystals will go up and down. Crystals used to be a lot bigger than they are now. It used to be mass coverage. Alt Med is the big area. And Alt Med is top news. So, I mean, yes, we'll win victories here. We will lose victories there. But the, the big thing is that we are better known and broader. Question? Do you think... Skepticism yes. is something we should yes. be evangelistic about. Simon Sink 1. Yeah, no, no, excuse me. Uh, Simon Sink 1, breaking news. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, is skepticism something we should uh, be evangelistic about? I don't know if there's another word. But to proselytise to other people, or is that a bad thing, or is it a good thing, or, or is it even possible to no, it's very possible. spread I mean, it around by just talking to people, or whatever? You have to be careful of your methods. I mean, there used to be what I used to call, was called the provo wing of the sceptics, right? They'd always go for the throat, right? And they'd basically become... Um, as dogmatic as a lot of the people they were criticising. And that's the problem. I think we have to be... We have to, one, we have to keep stressing the scientific basis of what we do. You can't just say, I'm a sceptic, thump. Right? I'm better than you, thump again. You can't do it. It doesn't work. I mean, you put people off. It's hard enough anyway to say you're a sceptic, quite frankly. People just say you're a spoiled sport. Right? And then to say, I'm a sceptic and I hate you. Right? It's not going to work. You have to explain what you do. some cases, it's impossible. You just, there are people who you come against a brick wall who will, Tim mentioned the song, who you just yeah, I mean, give up. It isn't worth the bother a lot of the time. It's, yes, so it's, always, it's always worth it. I mean, the, the, the fact is you, you argue with a thousand people if one person you turn is worth it. Quite right. It's like I, I was a teacher at one stage and I knew that you reach one kid in the class you think it's worthwhile. Dave, again? <laughs> you have another question? Uh, not yeah. uh, I was just bouncing. Oh, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a copy of the Fifth Magazine talking about change of technology, and there's a story of skeptics in the media, which talks about a, 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 a media story about a, a, some, a medium who uh, led searches to discover a group of lost people. The committee, it says here, we immediately sent the story airmail to the English media, <laughs> and they promptly replied by airmail. <laughs> I know. That, that, that's the problem. We're often too late, you know, in getting the story out. And you're sort of like, sorry. I have a question. Oh. What's airmail? I know, exactly. I know. <laughs> but don't forget, in our subscription form, and once upon a time, up until fairly recently, we had options of C mail and airmail. <laughs> C mail hasn't existed for about three million years. So, you know, it just doesn't happen. But I mean, I know. And that's, that was the thing. We were, we were, so it was surprising we actually did so well considering all the limitations we had. But then there weren't limitations at that day, so that was the way it worked. Right? And it was fun. I think it still is fun. I think it's actually more fun now than it ever has been because there's so many options open to you. But, we, uh, but I mean, it's still a battle. But, hey, there are more people here tonight than most of our early meetings ever had. And this is not a big meeting. No. No. It's big, big, big. Uh, on the um, 17th of April, Saturday, 17th of April, we have a dinner meeting and it's sold out it's sold. Uh, three weeks in advance. So, I'll show you yeah. 150 people. Any more questions? John? Uh, yes, I'm just wondering. 
Do you think it's important to keep a distinction between scepticism and atheism? Yes, I do. I, th I think um, I think it often creeps in, and a lot of sceptics are atheists, obviously, right? But one of the big arguments is: do the sceptics investigate God? And from my point of view, no, not God per se. What God does, what she does, <laughs> we do investigate. Obviously, any manifestation of God is fair game because that you can actually put to the test: a shroud of Turin, a miracle, a changing of water to wine, or wine to water, which I do all the time. Um, you know, anything like that, anything like that that you can actually sort of put to the test. Absolutely, and that actually covers a lot. It's just that mystical, mythical figure out there who's like lightning. Actually, you can test lightning too, right? That, that, you can even test the power of prayer, which has been done, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, you, trying to disprove God is ridiculous. You, know? you can logically argue it. That's what the atheists do. That's what the rationalists do. what the humanists do. But we have to make sure that as far as God is concerned, we're not pure cynics. Personally, I don't believe in God. I have no need to believe in God. I have no reason to believe in God. And, but, you know, I'm not going to argue with someone saying God doesn't exist because I don't believe it because I don't want to believe it but or everything else that happens but they don't disprove God Shroudaturians are fake, miracles are fake weeping walls and mouldy seal ceilings and this sort of stuff are fakes but yeah, people, people have their faith and they have their faith in astrology and they have their faith in this, that and the other but I think, I think they should be separate although we share the same beliefs How do you see the faith of uh, astrology being different from believing in God? Astrology being different to... Yeah, you just drew a comparison of what you said that you didn't see them as being comparable. Astrology? Yeah, so that somebody who believes in astrology, you're saying that you wouldn't attack their belief. Oh, I'd attack the belief thoroughly, because that's totally testable. Is it different from, from God, though? It's different from the God bit of God. Yeah, I think so, because, I mean, they're, they're talking about planetary influences, and you can test the planetary influences, you can talk about gravity, you can talk about science throughout astrology, right? And you can test the results, and it's been done many times to see if yeah, you're born in a certain star sign, blah, 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 you know, raising, ascendant, descendant, whatever, triads, and you name it all. But, yeah, you can actually test the effectiveness, putting people to blind tests and say, what star sign am I, right? Classic, you've got one chance in 12, one chance in 13. <laughs> of knowing what star sign you are, right? And I've had people say, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> I'm not the guest, I say, I got it, so he told you. <laughs> very good, very impressed. But I mean, astrology can be tested. Most manifestations of religion can be tested. The one about the ultimate, you know, she being up there is just, you can't test it, you can't do anything about it. It's a belief. And the people who have faith in astrology... Right? And faith in psychic surgery and faith in UFOs and faith in God knows whatever. So whoever knows whatever. Right? But I mean, and those are people you, you can argue to you blue in the face. There's a question about, you know, sort of how much do you need to sort of proselytise, etc. And some people you will say, yes, I agree with you. Some people will agree with you just to shut you up. Right? And that's a pain. And others will say, yep, and think about it. You have to encourage the idea that scepticism is a universal attitude, not just for pseudoscience and paranormal. We are sceptical about used car salesmen. We are sceptical about real estate people. We are sceptical about journalists. We are sceptical in so many areas. Someone comes along to you and says, I can fly. The first thing you say, you don't say is, oh, wow, fantastic, I'll go tell my friends. The first thing you say, show me. And that is scepticism. Simple thing, show me. When people say, that's right. They understand what scepticism is, and you say... Show me in astrology. Show me in this. Show me in everything else, and that works. That really does work. What is the position of skeptics on intelligent design and brilliant and poetry? Um, from a technical point of view, it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, creationism, you know, devoting into intelligent design is like you know, sort of changing its name to protect the guilty. Um, it's it, it's 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 annoying. It's dangerous. It certainly was in the early days because it was infiltrating the science classes, the curriculum in Queensland, and certainly and moving down into here. Books like that stopped it to a certain extent, being taught in those classes. But I mean, it's—I don't think we have any problem at all with saying it's absolute rubbish. Every aspect of it, nothing in it. So I, that's, I mean, in most areas you say, <laughs> you know, yes, but no, but. Homeopathy is, is, is absolutely no, 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 right? And then, yeah, but, and creationism is the same thing. Intelligent designers say, you've got your religious belief, do not claim it as science, please, right? Because it's not true. And you can go through and bam, 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 and pull everyone apart. They've got, they'll come back with arguments to those who are well-organised. They always will. 
but the homeopaths do the same thing. Um, before, before there are any more questions, let me lean towards you. Um, just a tweet from uh, Simon Singh here. Um, this is a, obviously a quote from the from the judges. First of all, that the, the um, judgment was um, three. Uh, to none. So all three judges uh, agreed with the decision and that they said that not a jot of evidence which is the statement that uh, was deemed libelous is a statement of opinion and one backed by evidence. evidence. <laughs> you just twist off as I was going to say. And one, so not a jot of evidence is a statement backed by opinion. So is a statement of opinion and one backed by reasons. So it's looking very good for Simon Singh. That's excellent. Can he claim damages? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they'll have to pay his, uh, his costs if they lose. Okay. It's not, a, it's not a final win yet. What it, is, what it means is that he now will have to argue his case based on the fact that it's, um, that it's an opinion and not um, uh, as ruled previously by, uh, by yeah. the judge. I, I think that, that's one of the things. Skepticism is not without cost. Yeah. Right? Sometimes it's financial cost, sometimes it's personal cost. I have major fights with a brother-in-law who's, you name it, is into it. Every conspiracy theory, he sells all, this, all the stuff as well. He actually sells, retails, all these things. And we have come to blows. I mean, I mean we have come to blows. <laughs> and therefore you think, well, this is great for family relationships. You have a nice family dinner and then you sort of fighting over the dinner table. It's, you, you learn to shut up after a while, if you like. You know, he doesn't. <laughs> but I do, because I'm better, better than him. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. This is Brian Dunning from the Skeptoid Podcast. Been enjoying your critical thinking shows in audio only? (laughs) You've been missing half the fun. Check out my new video podcast, In Fact on iTunes, or click it on Skeptoid.com. Three pilot episodes of In Fact are available now for immediate viewing. I'm looking for sponsorship to produce an entire first season of 13 episodes, and hopefully many more seasons to follow. You can see the whole lineup and get all the other nuts and bolts if you go to Skeptoid.com and click on In Fact. And don't forget to come back to the Skeptic Zone when you're done watching. I I think it's audio only, (laughs) but that's okay. I still like it. This is Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Dr. Rachie Reports. Wow, what a few very busy days it's been in the skeptical world this week. I'm going to tell you about a couple of things this week on Dr. Rachie Reports, but first up, I'm going to cover the latest tantrum from the Australian Vaccination Network. Last week, I blogged on Skeptic's book about information I had received, which described the Australian Vaccination Network being refused paid advertising in a mother's and baby's newspaper. The Child Group of Magazines publishes a series of free monthly magazines across Australia which are personalised to each location, such as Sydney's Child, Melbourne's Child, Brisbane's Child, etc. The publications are distributed via childcare centres and baby shops and are therefore highly targeted to Australian parents. As such, they're the perfect place for the AVN to spread their misinformation and possibly scare a whole new bunch of parents into not vaccinating. But in a surprising and pleasing move, the publishers, Copeland Press, decided against taking the anti-vaxxers' money and denied the AVN's request to advertise. Now, this comes after the AVN had originally planned to place advertising in all of the child publications across Australia in 2009. Or was it the Australian newspaper? Don't worry, it will all become clear in a moment. The reason this sounds confusing is because from March to June 2009, Meryl Dorry promoted a fundraising drive with a promise of financial assistance from Jenny McCarthy's Generation Rescue to pay for an autism advertisement. 
The cost was going to be $53,000 and it was to fund a full page advertisement in the Australian newspaper, which is a national newspaper. And Generation Rescue would pay one third of the cost if the AVN could raise the rest. Now, Merrill set a deadline of Monday, March the 9th, 2009, to raise the required approximately $35,000. But after they'd raised only $7,000, Merrill changed tact. She said, In the interests of actually bringing this to pass, and also due to rethinking who our target audience will be, we have decided to go for a full-page ad in every edition of Copeland Publishing's Child Magazines, of which there are six published every month for every capital city in Australia. Too bad if you'd already donated money thinking it was going towards an ad in the Australian, I guess. But nevertheless, the ads never appeared. And what happened to the money? Well, I certainly don't know. However, the fact that the ads never appeared, either in the Australian newspaper or Copeland Press, may have something to do with a competing advertisement which was published by Australian Skeptics in the Australian newspaper on August 6, 2009. Now this effectively gazumped the AVN to the punch. Our ad was a quarter page in the Australian and was famously funded by Dick Smith and it warned parents of the misinformation and scaremongering of the AVN and advised them to seek health information and vaccination advice from qualified professionals like doctors. So now if we fast forward to April 2010 and we find out that the AVN are once again attempting to spread their information, this time in the Copeland Press again. We hear that they have purchased one third page ads in Sydney's Child, Melbourne's Child and Brisbane's Child at a total estimated cost of $8,000 and this request, as I said, was denied. I blogged about this on April the 2nd on Skeptic's book. And it was also blogged on the Australian Skeptics website on the same date. On April the 5th, I received an email entitled RE Ad, which simply contained the text, You are liars. But as it turns out, we, whoever we are, weren't lying. On April the 6th, four days after my post on Skeptics Book, Meryl Dory sent an e newsletter explaining what had happened and saying she was only doing so because her hand had been forced. She confirmed that the AVN had booked three times quarter page ads. I said one third, so I got this wrong. But on March the 31st, she had received an email advising her that, quote, the publisher and editor of the child magazines have decided that they are unable to publish your advertisement in the upcoming issue. As independent publishers, All material placed is at our discretion. So it turns out that I was not a liar after all. Strange, isn't it? False accusations from the anti-vaxxers? Who'd have thunk it? But what made Dory particularly angry and also explains why she had to send this post at all was that those meddling sceptics had known about this. She said, Our committee was of two minds about how and when to tell you about this situation. In consultation together, however, we have decided that the release of these details on the internet by others has taken the decision out of our hands. She even copied and pasted my entire blog post into the rant. Even the part where I say, if she was not already convinced there is a conspiracy to see her silenced, then she ought to be well and truly by now. Paranoid much? Well, maybe you should be, Meryl. However, it is clear Merrill was pretty rattled when she wrote this, which likely explains the following errors in her post. Quote, Because the head honcho of the sceptics had blogged about this very issue only a few days earlier and had indicated that he would be contacting parenting publications to ensure that they do not take any advertising from us. So I wish to state here and now that I am neither a the head honcho of Australian sceptics, or B, a he. And on top of this, nowhere in my post did I state I would be contacting other parenting publications, and I can unequivocally state I did not contact Copeland Press. But in another example of Streisanding, Meryl pasted my URL within her e-newsletter, and this resulted in an 800% peak in page loads, and a 400% increase in unique visitors to Skeptic's book. Thanks, Meryl. Of course, I got the usual stuff, some of which I'll share with you now, dear listeners. 
So here are some of the comments I've received in the last few days. You should get of your hate wagon because that is all it sounds like to me. This one comes from someone calling themselves you dogs. This is the most disgusting and hate-filled group of people I've stumbled across on the web. Seriously, are you for real? It's all cash for comments though, isn't it? Or are you all useful idoits? I think that's meant to be idiots. Ha ha, yet I wonder. Anyway, when people in your family start to get sick, don't worry at all. Your hate will fill you and will all that's needed to see you through. Oh, that's right. You have all you need in science, don't you? Ha 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 ha. Enjoy. And of course, everyone's favourite, Godwin's Law. Wow, you are a modern version of the Nazi brown shirts. Were you bullied at school, dude? But what is interesting about this is Meryl's barring that this is tantamount to censorship and her free speech is being taken away. But the child has every right to refuse material they fear may reflect badly on them or tarnish their reputation. And of course, the irony is that Meryl is only too willing to censor any shred of information that does not align with her fear-mongering, conspiracy-littered ideas about vaccination. As one commenter on my blog said, the AVN's email list is aggressively culled of dissent. The Facebook page is locked down to the point where you need to beg for admission and their very own magazine has a restrictive advertising policy. I'm willing to lay odds the AVN will turn down any ads submitted by, say, Australian sceptics. Well, this is a good point. But Merrill is so angry about this incident that she wrote another blog post saying that members of the Stop the Australian Vaccination Network group are immature and childish and need to grow up, entitled The Immaturity of Those Who Oppose Free Choice. Then, in a purely Barbara Lowe Fisher moment, she called for open discussion and debate about the issue of vaccine safety. She said, So, stop AVN, grow up, debate respectfully and show us your evidence. It's time to stop sniping and start communicating. Oh, the irony meter doth explode again. <laughs> and my desk has a perfect imprint of my head in it right now. So Meryl has started a letter-writing campaign to get all her members to tell Cumberland Press, the publishers of the child magazines, that they are very naughty and have done a very bad thing. We have also written to them to congratulate them on a responsible and ethical decision. Perhaps you would care to send your thoughts too. You can email marion at marion at sydneyschild.com.au, and that's spelled M-A-R-I-O-N. Also this week marks the beginning of World Homeopathy Awareness Week. And to celebrate, Late Line on ABC television ran a story by the wonderful Walkley Award-winning journalist Steve Kinane. The focus was the lack of power of our drug regulator, known as the Therapeutic Goods Administration or the TGA, to shut down pseudoscientific claims. And the example used was Merrill's mate, Franz Sheffield, who runs the woo-infested website called Homeopathy Plus. These are the guys who recently sent an email alert about the very dodgy homeopathy for breast cancer study with the headline, Homeopathy Effective for Breast Cancer and Non-Toxic. I took this paper apart on skepticsbook.com, so for more info, head over to the blog. The TGA received a complaint about information on Fran's website, particularly pertaining to claims about the effectiveness of homeopathic immunisation. They asked Fran to remove this information, but she simply ignored the ruling. So Steve Kinane asked Fran Sheffield why she had not complied, and she simply stated that she didn't agree with their findings. This was apparently the case for more than 30% of those reprimanded by the TGA in 2009. The story by Steve Kinane was a great expose of the failings of our drug and medicine regulator, the TGA. But in developments today, Fran Sheffield has jumped the shark big time. On her website, she published a response to the Late Line piece addressing Steve's claims that her evidence is dodgy. The response was entitled, Can Homeopathy Immunise Against Epidemic and Infectious Diseases? Can Homeopathy Address Serious Diseases Such as AIDS and Cancer? No, she didn't. Uh, yes, she did. About AIDS, she says, Homeopathy has been shown in the following trials and studies to safely treat AIDS without toxic side effects. She then followed this up with a copy-paste of 12 references. Gish gallop away, Fran. 
some of which are abstracts from conference presentations, some of which are from alt-med journals, and some from everybody's favourite homeopath, Dana Ullman. On cancer, Fran says, homeopathy has been shown in the following trials and studies to be effective for cancer and without toxic side effects. And this was followed by the same gish gallop of copying and pasting of references. You see, it is illegal in New South Wales to claim you can cure incurable diseases, and this of course includes cancer and AIDS. This comes under the Public Health Act, the Code of Conduct for Unregistered Practitioners, which was introduced in August 2008. And I'm also pretty sure the Australian Homeopathic Association would not be too impressed to hear one of their own making such claims. And even if Fran is not a member of the AHA, she surely falls under the jurisdiction of the Healthcare Complaints Commission, and this means her claims about cancer and AIDS are unlawful. And meanwhile, the TGA is sitting on its hands. So, to celebrate World Homeopathy Awareness Week, I'm going to send a complaint to the HCCC or the Australian Homeopathic Association. So that's just some of the happenings from a very busy week, which included Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy splitting up. And until next time, this has been Dr. Rachie Reports. Grain of salt, grain of salt, grain of salt. Grain Let's all take this with a grain of salt. Here's Iran Segev. Grain of salt now, grain of salt, you can take it with a... I have with me today on the phone Wendy Whelan. Wendy, thank you very much for being with me on the Skeptic Zone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, Wendy, you're a you're a GP nurse plus a lot of other things. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, in general practice in a little country town, you you tend to multitask, um, and one of my principal jobs is a practice nurse, but also the practice manager and receptionist. And do you care? Would you care to tell us what the country town is? Ah, yes, Gilgandra in New South Wales, the hub of the Central West. The hub of the Central West, okay. So well, h- how big is Gilgandra? Uh, it's got a population of about 2,000, but then if you take in the Shire as well, I would imagine it would be three or 4,000. It sort of is the junction of three highways, so it does tend to get fairly busy, and it has a few small outlying towns that have got limited medical resources. And how how far is or how close is the nearest uh, big town? Uh, three quarters of an hour away, 70 kilometres. And that's to Dubbo, is that correct? That, that's correct. Yes, okay. And um, how many GPs are there in Gilgandra? Uh, well, we've had a bit of an explosion, really. We've gone from one GP, which was Dr Giltrap, that I um, originally started working to, for, to now having uh, one, two, three... A five, I think. Five? Our, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, five, one down the main street, one at the hospital. Yes, five. That's good. Yeah, good. five GPs, which is amazing. I don't think any of them are, are languishing for work either, I might add. So um, it just goes to show the amount of work that there is in a little, little town. Okay, now I, I want to um, explain why I actually wanted to interview you. And the, the reason I yeah. wanted to interview you is because I've heard through um, uh, reliable sources that um, you have this year reached 100% vaccination rates. Is that correct? That is correct. However, on our last one, so we must note this at the beginning, at, at, on our last one, there was one child that went through, and so now I think we're 98.8. We're not actually 100%, and I was rather devastated by that because I was very proud of our um, 100% rate. But having said that, 98.8 is not too bad either. No, it isn't. Uh, <laughs> now, and this is, this is for a specific uh, GP practice or is it...? Um, yes, it, yes, it is. That's our, um, that's our one for our practice. But having said that, because it is a little country town, uh, we tend to all work together. So, not so I don't know so much about it as in the extra doctors, not so much extra doctors, but certainly the um, early childhood nurse and the uh, motherhood nurse, we would tend to work in together. So if they felt that there was a child in need and one of them wasn't in, um, then they would come and see me. And I guess if I wasn't in the situation to do it, vice versa. So we tend, do tend to work together, but those statistics are for our surgery alone. 
And do you have any idea what the uh, statistics are for the other surgeries? No, I don't actually. Not not at all. But I um, just sort of reading in the uh, I don't know what it was in Apna or one of those sort of nursing mag- magazines. They were saying that the, the immunisation rates were down. Um, uh, throughout New South Wales. Now, whether or not that applies to Gilgandra, I don't know. I would be surprised because we're pretty diligent as a town at trying to um, get vaccinations up to date and keep them that way. Can you tell me a little bit about the population, the, the socioeconomic status the, um, yep. and, and um, the kind of problems that the population might tend to have, medical problems that the population might tend to have in Gilgandra? It's an interesting little town, actually. There's uh, quite a significant uh, Aboriginal population and there's also a significant age population. In addition to that, in the 20 years that I've worked there, I've had the pleasure of um, having the grandparents bring the children in and then now those children have had children. So in a lot of cases, there's three generations of family that are coming through the surgery and occasionally four. Um, and the interesting thing about is, that is, is that you therefore tend to see patterns in health problems. There's a large amount of diabetes in the town um, that cert- tends to run in certain families and the derivatives of it. Asthma is a big problem. It was when I first came to the town that end stage sort of renal and cardiac problems and amputations and the complications of diabetes were very rampant. I would think that that's diminished and certainly the health care for a variety of reasons has improved and perhaps that's also the rapport in the town. There's a fairly large unemployed segment in the town but it's also not an apathetic town. It's a town where people have a go at trying to sort of get out and do things. It's been largely a farming community that suffered largely from the drought. And that's caused a lot of problems. It's caused various mental health problems and various other stress problems that tend to go with those sorts of things. Also being a rural area and prone to drought and flooding and whatever, we've got a large influx uh, seasonally of both Ross River, Q fever, glandular fever and those sorts of things as well. So I guess that, you know, apart from your normal sort of ageing illnesses that would come within a um, community. So you tend to have the two extremes of the childhood illnesses, you know, your tonsillitis and the middle ears and all of those sorts of things, and also your age ones, as well as the problems that are um, idiosyncratic to the Aboriginals. From your description of the population in Ugandra, it sounds to me like the, the population could be at high risk should there be an outbreak of communicable, a communicable disease such as uh, pertussis or some other vaccine-preventable disease? And I'm just wondering whether you've had any such outbreaks in the past. Yes. Uh, yes, we did. We have had um, pertussis outbreaks, certainly in the last couple of years. That seems to have happened more in uh, adults and some children, either children that are too young to be vaccinated uh, yet or occasionally in some primary age children. Not sure why that end has happened. There have been children been fully vaccinated, but certainly in the adults, there are people where their immunity has dropped off, we presume. And so, of course, now that the Boostrix is available to um, grandparents and then this year to sort of healthcare workers, hopefully that will help that problem. As far as the others, um, uh, no, we haven't. Very, very little of sort of the... Um, meningococcal or the uh, tetanus or the rubella and I think only one or two measles in the last multiple years so it's pretty good really okay. but certainly if that did did break loose that would be a you know it would spread like wildfire in a little town like this Okay so um, obviously you consider vaccines to be quite an important public health measure I, I think it is vital and I not only consider that it's vital for the immediate health, but I consider that it's vital for the ongoing health because of the risk of spreading it to um, compromised members of the community, such as the age, such as the babies or people with reduced immunity. And if you can get people to not be afraid of them and to see it as a, you know, 
um, just another part of their preventative health care and that in fact preventative health care is worthwhile doing, then I think, I think it's, you know, essential really. So do you, feel, do you feel that there's any fear in the community about vaccines? You said they have to get over their oh, fear. Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. I, I feel it's got better over the years, but certainly um, from the point of view of your pneumovaxes and your flu vaccines, and of course the swine flu, when it came in last year, there was a lot of fear initially because it was the unknown. Um, it was a vaccine that hadn't been tested for long and a lot of people felt that it was a reaction or a response to um, hysteria slightly. So they were very anti having it done. They're now much better with that. But for ongoing number of years, the, the main community that I want to target for preventative health is the Aboriginal population, particularly for their flu needles and their pneumovaxes. Now, they're always my lowest group. They seem to have this, um, uh, I don't know what you would call it, just like a innate sort of a fear of needles as much as anything. Not so much the actual vaccine and the childhood vaccines they're fine with, but it's the older people. They're, they don't respond nearly as well as I would like them to do. And, you know, they'll say, yes, they'll come, but then they won't come back and have their needles done. So you've got to be really opportunistic and almost a little pushy at times to get some of your older population. And that's a shame because I think they, you know, they're in need and um, I think they're at high risk, you know, particularly bearing in mind that the Aboriginal mortality rate is about 20 years, you know, shorter than the average um, white Caucasian. Um, and oftentimes, I think preventively, and uh, I think we've got a really good rapport with the Aboriginal people here, it's something that I'd like to be able to improve if I could. And what have you done this year in order to get to 100% immunisation? I don't think there's anything spectacularly different in this year. I think you could just best sum it up by um, being ongoing, um, consistent, in as much as that they know that they are able to get their needles here, that we're always be available, pretty opportunistic so if a situation arises where um, people can be vaccinated then we do we've always got supplies on hand and I personally make sure that I'm always available whether it's convenient or not but I think probably the biggest success story is the fact that we've got a really good rapport with the other allied health workers whether it be the community nurses, the childhood nurses the speeches or the women's health, it doesn't matter. We're, we're really lucky to have a good rapport in the community and, um, and I've got excellent doctors that I work for. So that all works together, you know, for the best of the patients, I believe. So it's certainly not a Wendy Whelan lone effort. I can assure you of that. It, it's, I would think that while it's our surgery, um, I think there's lots of people feed in to make things a success, not normally just one person. Have you been working with the other surgeries in order to promote uh, vaccinations as a public health measure to the community at large rather than just the community, the part of the community that uh, attends your surgery? Uh, if ever they, like the, particularly uh, there is a surgery at the hospital that's a new surgery, I've certainly promoted it to them. We would probably be the most senior surgery in as much as that I just mean that we've been there the longest and probably know the ropes easier. So I guess from a consultant point of view, I'm there and I'm available and that and it's it's quite often is me that they will ring if there's any problems. And often even our chemists, because we've only got one chemist in town and although she's great, uh, she'll often ring me up and sort of say, you know, um, you know, I've got this problem, what do you think? And I guess we would be two colleagues together rather than one person being better than the other. Um, so, yes, I, I, any active chance that I would get it, I would promote it. But we also have an immunisation conference in Dubbo each year for all the little towns and all the surgeries, so they would promote it as well. There are organisations, and there are organisations that we um, fight with quite a lot, that try to promote all kinds of fear and, uh, and misinformation about vaccines. Do you feel that they're having some kind of effect in your environment? Well, that's an interesting question, actually. I, if it, had it been prior to Medicare giving their incentive payments for having completed um, vaccines, then I think people would have tended to use that more, especially for the children, but certainly not now. 
uh, except for perhaps the swine flu, and it's now been integrated more as well. But certainly in the older lot, there's a lot of people that say they don't need it, um, that they've seen other people have um, bad reactions, etc., etc. And that is a much harder group to get done. People seem to be happy enough to do their children, but not themselves. They don't realise that they're the extended arm that, you know, can infect their families as much as anything else. So I guess rather than a specific organisation, there just seems to be this general slight nerviness, if you would like, amongst um, particularly the Aboriginal community or the lower socioeconomic groups where they're perhaps not as well informed. But I believe continued education and consistent education is perhaps the answer to that. Now, Wendy, let me ask you this. I know you have grandchildren, so I, it's, I, I think yes. it would be fair to assume that you've been a nurse for quite a while. But since when have you been a nurse? Oh, since when? I started in 1974. I started nursing and um, I did nursing and um, also started speech therapy, but I also did my early childhood teaching. So got a few different um, caps, but nursing's my passion. I love my nursing. And you've, so in 1974, you, that was mm -hmm. maybe um, 13, 14 years out from the last cases of polio. Um, so, yes. so people would have, would have seen the effect of these diseases that are now, that since then have been prevented by, um, by vaccines. Have you seen over time as people know less and less of people who have suffered from vaccine preventable diseases that the tendency to immunize or to vaccinate tendency to uh, com complete the vaccination regime has deteriorated or what kind of effect have you seen over time? As regards specifically polio and say diphtheria are those the sorts of ones you're talking about? Well, I would assume, uh, again, I'm, I'm making a bit of an assumption here, so I'm interested to know your mm -hmm. opinion. My assumption is that vaccines are, in a sense, their own worst enemies because those terrible diseases that are now preventable by vaccines are gone. They're basically not there anymore, so people do not tend to see them. Nobody, okay. in, nobody uh, who is less than about... 35 knows many people knows many if any people with polio for example who have suffered from polio okay. I think probably um, I would agree with you except for one thing you've got to remember that now many people are traveling and I think travel medicine has probably re enlightened or re-educated people because as you would know that if you go to somewhere like the middle of Africa um, polio is still um, occurring there and therefore that's where you would have your eye pole vaccination there is only a couple of places um in the world where polio is still required to go and um you know as a prerequisite when you're traveling but because people are tending to go more and more to those sorts of places now um we're finding that they're a little bit more aware i used to find that they were a bit ho-hum but not so much so now they they tend to be um more aware the biggest thing i find is not so much that they won't have the vaccinations done but that they don't allow enough time to have the vaccination completed fully and that that bothers me for instance you know for the hepatitis a you know like hepatitis was around a lot when i was a child not so much now as an adult in fact very rarely as an adult people don't realize that you need two vaccines one six months later to complete the vaccination and that's the problem that i'm tending to see more of that people don't come and um willingly follow up for the second one they intend to they just don't get around to it or they don't see the value of it do you think that's probably because they're not worried enough about those those illnesses i think they uh, no i don't think it's so much that they're not worried about it i think it's a combination of things i think they we live in a society where one one fix fixes everything. So people tend to think that if you have one vaccine, it's going to fix the whole lot. And anything that in our health system I've found that requires an ongoing process tends to run the risk of not being fully compliant. And I think that's the biggest thing, whether, the, whether it be immunisation or um, 
your ongoing enhanced primary care for the chronic diseases, any of those sorts of things that requ requires an ongoing commitment needs ex extra diligence on our um, part and record keeping because they're the ones that people tend to um, fall down on, I guess. I guess people just get busy as much as anything. I don't think it's necessarily not wanting to do it. They just don't get there. Wendy, thank you very much for giving me of your time. And um, no it's, been, it's been great speaking to you and, and well done on the achievement of getting 100% vaccination, mm -hmm. even if it has now dropped to, what, 98 point? Eight. 90, 90 point. Eight. <laughs> okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah, right, guys, I was talking to uh, Richard Saunders the other day. All right. Uh, he said if we record a trailer for our podcast, Skeptics with a K, uh, he'd play it on their, on their show. Well, that's nice of him. That's very generous. It's pretty good. I'm not sure what we could do, though. I mean... Well, I suppose you tell people what the show's about. But it's basically just this. Yeah. Like, yeah. But, yeah, we talk about science and scepticism and things. That's, that's true. I suppose you, know, you mentioned the website address. What, merseysideskeptics.org.uk? Yeah, yeah. Or just, like, search us on iTunes. Oh, and then we could end with, like, a big song, like, The Skeptics with a K no, podcast. No, 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 no. no. Don't, don't do that. I'm Carly Sturgis, and today I'm talking to Crispian Jago. Crispian works in information technology and lives in Hampshire, England, where he keeps a very beautiful garden. Online, he says he's well known for pointing a satirical and bogey-stained finger at those who prefer dogma and irrational beliefs. His site, Science, Reason and Critical Thinking, features rave reviews by the likes of Adam Savage, Phil Plate and Ben Goldacre for his creative depiction of sceptics using playing cards and parody. He also features album reviews on his site www.crispian.net. Hello Crispian and thanks for the opportunity for an interview. Hi Kylie, many thanks for having me on. You describe yourself on your site as an IT consultant specialising in software test management and consultancy with a passion for music and science. So do you also call yourself a sceptic and why? Uh, yeah, I would absolutely describe myself as a sceptic. And thanks for pointing out that I obviously forgot to include that word on my blog profile. I probably need to update that. But IT consultancy is my day job. Um, I have my own company. I specialise in software testing strategies and test processes. But... As much as I enjoy that, my passion is indeed for science and music. And I guess, despite a temporary religious blind spot during my late teenage years, I've always been sceptical. I just didn't really recognise myself as a sceptic until probably a couple of years ago when I started attending Sceptics in the Pub in London and it became immediately obvious to me that these are my people and that's what I was. So since then, I've worked with my local sceptical compadre, Dave Hughes, and we've set up the Hampshire Sceptic Society and we now run another Skeptics in the pub in Winchester in Hampshire. And um, that's all going very well. There seems to be a great deal of desire for sceptical events and, and critical thinking. So it's all good. Do you think that there's more sceptically minded people involved in IT or is the profession like any other? Well, I guess there's a lot of people in IT. So it's hardly surprising that a fair number of them are involved in the um, sceptical community. But I suspect that... Um, both critical thinking and woo-woo exist within all professions. Perhaps IT attracts more geeky, nerdy, sciencey sort of people who are uh, maybe predisposed to more science and reason and critical thinking rather than fairies and pseudoscience and irrational nonsense. You're the creator of a very popular blog called Science, Reason and Critical Thinking, which involves parodies of ladybird books, tarot cards and even interviews. What first inspired you to start creating that kind of site? Um, I started writing my science, reason and critical thinking blog um, just over 18 months ago. Uh, the main reason was that every time I went to um, Skeptics in the Pub, someone would invariably ask me, do you blog or what's the name of your blog? So one lunchtime when I couldn't be asked to leave my desk, I logged on to Blogger and I set up my blog. Um, I hadn't planned on doing it. I hadn't given it any thought. So when I was prompted with a flashing cursor following the question blog name, I just typed in the first thing that came into my head, which just happened to be science, reason and critical thinking. Perhaps with hindsight, I could have thought of something a bit more witty or pithy. But there you go. I'm not changing it now. So at first I tried to write serious posts about sceptical issues, but I think I just ended up sort of 
echoing thoughts and ideas that I've heard expressed much more eloquently by other um, writers and podcasters and bloggers. Uh, and then about a year ago, um, it was just before the initial Simon Singh hearing at the um, Courts of Justice, I was listening to a description of the case, I think it was on the on the SGU podcast, and I realised for the first time that the, the whole purpose of the Singh BCA trial was not to review the empirical evidence on the truth of the BCA's claims, but it was to bicker about semantics in, a, in an attempt to sort of silence valid criticism. And the moment that dawned on me, I immediately thought of the witch trial from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So I rewrote the witch sketch to the tune of, we have found a scientist, may we sue him? And I posted it on my blog later that day, and to my surprise, it was retweeted and linked. And uh, I thought, well, this is rather easy, just writing um, satirical, sceptical blogs. Rehashing Monty Python sketches is a lot easier than um, thinking of your own original stuff. So pretty much since then, rather than writing insightful, original reviews of important issues, I find it easier just to um, wave a shitty stick at irrational nonsense. Works for me. People may best know you as the creator of the Skeptic Trump Cards. How did they come to be, and what's been the overall reaction? Well, more plagiarism, really. Uh, Christina Martin put together a great pack of God Trumps in the New Humanist magazine a while ago, so I thought I'd basically just pinch that idea. Um, I initially wrote some tarot cards featuring various woo merchants. Uh, Then I wrote some quack Trumps featuring various advocates of different alternative medical tripe. Uh, and then I got an email from uh, Jack of Kent, and he suggested I create another set of cards for, for well-known sceptics. Uh, so I worked out various categories like special power and weapon of choice and arch nemesis, and I wrote a short bit about a whole bunch of well-known sceptics. Then I started trying to, to mock up some, some top trump cards. I originally just used some photos of famous sceptics that I'd just um, harvested from a, a Google image search. But when I put the cards together, they didn't seem to look quite right so I thought I'd try and create some sort of uh, unique avatar for each character and I was again looking around on the web for a way of doing that when I stumbled upon the Simpsonizer uh, which is basically um, a website that's to promote the Simpsons movie where you can create your own Simpsons based avatar it it actually produced um, uh, a very sort of fairly generic sort of character so I had to fart about in Photoshop for quite a bit just to make the um, the characters look a bit more recognisable but I thought they came out pretty good. Uh, So I created the cards and I uploaded them to my blog and once again I was rather surprised by the by the response that I've got. Um, People like Adam Savage and Phil Plate and Penn and Teller and Darren Brown uh, all seemed to rather like their cards and again they started um, tweeting them and sending out the links. Um, So it all worked out quite well. Um, I was thinking of producing physical copies of the cards and I did get quite a few requests to actually produce some physical cards but I figured um, the Fox Corporation might become a little bit protective of their uh, Simpsons copyright, and I didn't really want to, to push it too far to see what I could get away with. So I left it at that. Uh, and then a couple of months ago, I wrote uh, a parody on a, on the Dr. Seuss's Cat in the Hat um, about the planned papal visit to the UK, which I entitled The Twat in the Hat. And I attempted to, to illustrate it myself using my own crude artistic ability. Um, and then after I posted that, um, I got a message on Twitter from a professional caricature artist, a guy called Neil Davis, who had read that twat in the hat, and he offered me his services for any future blogs, uh, and he sent me some samples of his of his work, which was absolutely excellent. So I s- emailed him straight back and said, well, how about redoing the old top trump cards with um, some nice original caricature joins? And he was up for that. So the sceptic Trump cards now have a new format. Uh, I've rewritten the descriptions, I've got some excellent new original artwork, and I've started publishing a whole new set of cards, which I've been uploading daily onto my Science, Reason and Critical Thinking blog. So I hopefully will keep going until we've got the the whole set of 50 to 60 uh, sceptic cards loaded up. And hopefully this time we won't have any copyright issues, so if there's a a desire to actually produce a, a physical copy of the cards, we might be able to do something about it this time. And I should really put a plug in for Neil, who is the guy who's doing the the illustrations for me. So please do take a look at his website. It's www.caricatureclub.co.uk. And if you do like his illustrations, you can commission your own personalised caricature, unless you're a well-known sceptic, in which case he's probably done you already and you're in my pending 
file of uh, cards to, uh, to publish. On your music review blog, which is just as detailed as your science, reason and critical thinking blog, you've written that music should not be wallpaper. It should be art. If it's done properly, like a good book, film, painting or sculpture, it should rouse us. Do you think that there should be more artists involved in scepticism and how could that be encouraged? Ah, oh, bless you for mentioning my music blog. Not not many people actually read that one. I get quite a bit of traffic from my uh, my science reason and critical thinking blog, but no one really reads my music blog, which is a, a bit disheartening. But there you go. But yeah, I I feel very passionate about about um, about music. Music has the power to stir up sort of something deep within. In fact, I suspect that that sort of intense religious euphoria that um, is experienced by some sort of believers is a result of the same sort of complex brain activity that um well it didn't fire for me when i uh, went to see billy graham in concert but when i went to my first pink floyd gig um it completely blew me away i suspect it's the same sort of uh, neurological process that's going on there and of course if you can combine sort of music and skepticism with half the talent of uh of mr tim minchin then that would be completely awesome but um my main concern is with the, the sort of musical commercial dirge churned out by Saturday night TV talent shows seems to be the sort of musical equivalent of fast food Um, it may well dominate the marketplace with its sort of bland, easily digestible soulless but commercial successful formula but I'm rather concerned that rearing our kids on this junk they just won't be able to develop the, the musical palette that has brought me so much pleasure So what's next? Do you have future plans for either your artwork or your blog? Well, I must admit, I do get um, quite a buzz from writing my blog, um, especially the Science Reasoning Critical Thinking blog. So I just hope that I continue to get some more, hopefully, mildly amusing ideas that I can use to emphasise the absurdity of things like homeopathy and weird religious dogmas and New Age mumbo-jumbo and pseudoscience. And rest assured, as soon as I can think of a suitable way of taking the piss out of them, I shall be posting it on my blog. Thank you again, Crispian, for joining us. It's been wonderful to hear from you. Many thanks. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Don't forget to check out his ongoing projects. You can head to the crispian-jago.blogspot.com site, which is called Science, Reason and Critical Thinking, to find out more about his projects. And, of course, his album reviews and much more feature at www.crispian.net. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone, and thank you once again to all those people who write in and tell me what they do while they're listening to The Skeptic Zone. The team and I are getting a great deal of enjoyment out of all the stories we're hearing about what people are up to, walking the dog, walking the cat. It's really nice to know what you're doing while you're listening to The Skeptic Zone, especially those people who listen to us when they're working late into the night, shift workers and so on. I'm really glad that we're keeping you company. So, until the next episode, this is Richard Saunders signing off once again from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports. The Skeptic Zone